Well, good morning, Greenwich, and welcome to the Tuesday, December 19th edition of the Basement Academy. Let's talk some more about heaven. What do you say? <laughs> A lot more fun and enjoyable than talking about judgment and dragons and beasts and everything, right? So let me read Psalm 138, uh, which is a psalm that pictures worship, bowing down towards the temple and exalting God. Um, and then we're going to talk about heaven without a temple and why that is. Psalm 138. I will praise you, O Lord, with all my heart. Before the gods, I will sing your praise. I will bow down toward your holy temple and will praise your name for your love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. When I called, you answered me. You made me bold and stout-hearted. May all the kings of the earth praise you, O Lord, when they hear the words of your mouth. May they sing of the ways of the Lord, for the glory of the Lord is great. Though the Lord is on high, he looks upon the lowly, but the proud he knows from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the anger of my foes. With your right hand, you save me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not abandon the works of your hands. I love Psalm 138. That has been a favorite for a very, very long time. Mm. Okay. Just one more thought about the city that comes down out of heaven from God, uh, chapter 21, before I read chapter 22, and we shift the picture from the city to really the Garden of Eden. Heaven being pictured as a city may confuse some of us. You know, I asked you, how do you picture heaven? You know, Peterson says, you know, most of us want to go to heaven like we want to go to Florida, right? <laughs> Most of us probably don't picture a city. We, we do probably, you know, maybe a town, but, you know, we've got land and we've got gardens and trees and waterfall. You know, we, we probably have more pastoral landscapes than cityscapes in our mind when we think about heaven to the degree that we think about heaven at all, right? Some of us don't. Or, or maybe you only think of it in, in a certain way, like just a place out of the bad place here, right? And so a couple things. Peterson in, in his chapter, again, a very thick, dense, meaty chapter. I encourage you to read it. By picturing heaven as a city, Peterson, I think, offers wise pastoral counsel. Heaven is not an escape. That's how most of us probably think about heaven. Here, it's bad. Here, it, it's, it hurts. Here, we're sad and grief and, you know, death and all. So let's just escape it all. We just want to go on vacation, an eternal vacation. And Peterson says, no, it, it's not escape. It's a sanctifying. The picture of the city that comes down to us is a picture of sanctifying, purifying, transforming this life that we live. It's hard here because of sin, because of brokenness, because of the rebellion in the garden. And so it's, let's not escape this world. Let's transform this world. And so, so Peterson points that out. So I think that's, that's helpful. Secondly, the city and its very um, tactile description, if I could say it that way, you know, it's measured. There's 12 gates and 12... Um, uh, uh, foundations and walls, etc. Materiality, the, 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 the way heaven is pictured with this city, there's a physicality, there's a materiality which guards us against thinking of heaven as some wispy, ethereal spirituality where we're just kind of disembodied spirits 
floating around on the clouds somewhere out there. No! It's a new heaven and a new earth. There's materiality. There's physicality. The resurrection of Jesus teaches us that. Our creeds affirm that I believe in the resurrection of the body. Our bodies will be raised to new life. Well, are we going to be young or old? I don't know. We're not told that. What about those who've been cremated? If God can take the dust of the earth and breathe, fashion it into uh, a, a human and breathe life into as he did with Adam in creation, he can do that again. So I got no problem with that, okay? God knows how to work with dust. He's good with that. And so the, the notion of the city, heaven is physical, it's material. The, the city conveys this notion of it's full of people. It's full of, of, of activity. It, it's a community. Heaven is a community. It's not just me, excuse me, escaping the troubles of my life and being just with my family and the loved ones that I care about. And I don't care about anything else in heaven. I just want to see, you know, my mom and and, 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 and my dad and my grandma and grandpa again, and my dog, you know? No. <laughs> Heaven is not individual escapism, getting me out of troubles, you know, beam me aboard, Lord, you know, kind of like Star Trek, just beam me out of here. That is not the picture. The picture is actually of heaven coming here, right? It, it, there's a descent, okay? And, and so it's this... It, it's this notion that it's going to be living, right? We're not just going to float around and strum little harps all day. And we're not going to just be in church all day worshiping. It's going to be, you know, hallelujah chorus for eternity. We're going to be living. <laughs> we're going to live. <laughs> but we're going to live whole lives, sanctified lives, holy lives. We will live as we were intended to live originally. Be fruitful, multiply, <laughs> build, tend the garden, build society. I think there will be painting and there will be architects, architecture and there will be, we will live. We will enjoy, we will have relationships. And, and well, well, are we going to get old? Are we going to die again? Well, there's no more death there. Well, I don't want to get old and hurt. And, you know, I don't think there's pain there either because the scripture says so. So I just want to talk about the city guards us. It keeps us grounded in, in such an understanding which counteracts much of our pseudo understanding, uh, maybe Hollywood shaped understanding of kind of heaven is ghost like. No, it's, it's hard. It's material. Okay. Now let me read chapter 22. Uh, the, the first portion. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. Okay. So we're still in the city, right? On each side of the river stood the tree of life. Oh, well, is there one tree or more? Uh, on either side, on each side of the river stood the tree of life bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Oh, I love that language. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. The angel said to me, these words are trustworthy and true. The Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophet, sent his angel to show his servants the things that must soon take place. And so 
this is a, 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 a vision that gathers. You've got the throne. So now we're back into chapters four and five, the throne with the lamb and the four living creatures and the 24 thrones and the, and the thousands and thousands of angels gathered around. But you now have a, 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 that throne in a city that sure sounds like the Garden of Eden, right? Clearly there are allusions to the garden. The tree of life is that primary clue, right? And this notion of fruitfulness, the garden with its trees. And so what we have here is an image of the garden restored. So the city, the garden is in the city, I guess, and the river is running down the middle of the city. But there's a couple images going here. Genesis chapter 2, right, uh, about God placing the man uh, and creating the woman to be in the garden, right? And then Ezekiel 47, probably not as well known as Genesis 2. And so um, Ezekiel has a vision of the destruction of the temple and then the restoration and the rebuilding of the temple. And so in chapter 47, I'm going to skip around a little bit. The man brought me back to the entrance of the temple and I saw water coming out from under the threshold of the temple towards the east for the temple faced east because that's where the sun rises, right? So we face east and oh, we've got the, the sun shining upon us. The water was coming down from under the south side of the temple, south of the altar. He then brought me out through the north gate and led me around the outside to the out, outer gate facing east and the water was flowing from the south side. And then this man has a measuring line in his hands and he measures off and as they go further and further, the, the water is first ankle deep and then it is knee deep and then it is waist deep. And then there was a river that he could not cross. The river was deep enough to swim in. And then he led me back to the bank of the river. When I arrived there, I saw a great number of trees on each side of the river. Oh, 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 oh. that sounds like John. No, no, John is calling back the Ezekiel 47 image. Mm. As the water flows out, wherever it flows, it flows into the Dead Sea, the Salt Sea, and it brings it alive. It makes the water fresh. This, this image of the temple and the water is when the gospel is preached, it heals, it restores, it brings back to life. Mm. And then fruit trees of all kinds will grow on both banks of the river their leaves will not will not wither nor will their fruit fail every month they will bear because the water from the sanctuary flows to him flows to them their fruit will serve for food and their leaves for healing so sorry i skipped around a little bit there so read chapter 47 of ezekiel so what John's doing is he's gathering together scriptures. This goes all the way back, right? The last word on scripture. John's not saying anything new. He's pulling all that has been said and he's presenting it as fulfilled. <laughs> and so we have the garden restored. There's access now to that tree of life. There was banishment back in chapter three of Genesis, right? Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden. They were banished to live east of Eden. And there was an angel given a flaming sword to guard the way back, lest they take hold of the tree of life and live forever in that corrupted state. They needed to be purified. <laughs> and so what we have here is this picture and, and we've got no longer any curse. The curse has been removed. The curse from chapter three, the curse that God pronounced upon the serpent, upon the man and upon the woman, that curse is now removed. That's heaven, friends. <laughs> heaven is when the curse of sin is removed and it's been removed because Christ has died. The lamb has been slain and he has purchased men for God from every tribe, nation, language, and tongue. That's chapter five, right? Of chapters four and five of Revelation. 
And so all of this, see, we've been studying this, what, this is our 34th lesson, so we've been at this for what, you know, six or seven weeks. We've kind of lost a little bit of the plot. We have a lamb who was slain. His blood has redeemed. His blood removes the curse. That's the key. When we join to Jesus Christ, we are now joined to heaven. <laughs> The dwelling place uh, of God is now in the person of Jesus. And so by faith, we're joined to him. And so no one can come to the Father except through me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so Jesus removes the curse. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Heaven is life as it was supposed to be. <laughs> Renewed life, strengthened life, without any of the taint and fault and flaw and brokenness and all the manifestations of that. No anxiety, no guilt, no shame, no fear, no blaming the others, no avoiding the responsibility, no hiding in the bushes, all those things that we talk about all the time about chapter three of, of Genesis, the pointing the finger, the, the struggle between man and woman, no pain in childbirth, no thorns and thistles from the ground. All the curse is removed. That's heaven. Forget floating out there somewhere as a disembodied spirit strumming a harp or something. That's not heaven. Heaven is living without the curse. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's why we rejoice. We have, none of us have experienced life as God intended it. We taste a little bit of it. <laughs> Every now and again, we, we experience forgiveness and, and, and forbearance, and we have peace be with you and also with you. And we, we, we taste ecstasies for moments when we hear beautiful music as we did on Sunday and we sing, you know, these wonderful songs. Uh, our hearts are moved. But can you imagine the rest of your life and eternity without the curse, without sin, without anxiety, without fear, without regret, without shame, without longings that are not fulfilled. <laughs> you know, all those things that plague the human family will be gone. Hallelujah. Now, let's talk about this last thing. I want to, I want to land here and then we'll, we'll, we'll close and pick up tomorrow. In chapter 21... Verse 22, I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. And so we have to understand the function or the purpose of the temple, okay? And so God wants his people to know that he will dwell with them. That's Leviticus, right? So he, the tabernacle, so Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden. They sin, they are banished. They're out of the presence of God, but God is God comes to us, right? The initiative for salvation is always God's towards us. He comes to us and he initiates the relationship. He calls to Moses, 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 take off your sandals, burning bush. He leads the people out. They get to Mount Sinai. Uh, they, they get the Ten Commandments and then God shows him a tabernacle. He builds the tabernacle and, and you have three tribes on each side, east, west, north, south. And so the tabernacle... And there's, there's the Ark of the Covenant, right? And there's, but there's a curtain. Access to the presence of God is mediated. There must be a mediator. Moses is that mediator. The priest is the mediator. Moses goes into the presence of God and he has to put a veil over his face. The priest goes behind the curtain on the Day of Atonement. The temple is built. It's just a permanent tabernacle, right? And so the same thing, you have a curtain. You've got mediated access. We have a mediator. We don't have a unmediated access. We don't have immediate access. Adam and Eve had immediate access to God. Before sin, Adam and Eve walked with God in the cool of the day. They had immediate, immediate means without mediation. And so why there is no temple in heaven, we don't need mediated access. God is not hiding behind a curtain. The curtain has been torn. Pfft, the death of Jesus when he died, that curtain was torn. And so we have unmediated or immediate access to God, full access to God. We call him Father, <laughs> which, and, and Jesus talks about Abba, you know, Abba, and, and Paul talks about Abba, which is Daddy. It's, it's the intimate form of Father, not formal. 
Dearest Father, may I come into your presence and make a request of you? No. Daddy. Dad. It's a little child running into the presence of God. That's what is available to us. That is what heaven will be. <laughs> People and activity and community and living without the taint and curse of sin. Uh, and, and then access to God at any time we want. The presence of God all around us, in us, among us, through us. That is what heaven will be. And we taste it when we share the peace of Christ. We taste it when we come to the table. We taste it when we hear the gospel and say yes, and our hearts are moved. <laughs> and when we worship, hallelujah, for our Lord God reigns. So anyway, I got a little excited there, I think. Let's close and we'll talk about heaven a little bit more tomorrow, okay? Let's pray. Father, thank you. <laughs> thank you for the excitement that wells up in me just thinking about heaven. <laughs> without the curse. There is no curse and there is no temple. We have access to your presence finally, fully, and forever. And so, Lord, refresh us, renew us through the power of your Holy Spirit and the gospel of Jesus Christ. May that be our delight. And so help us to, 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 to lean into heaven and we thank you for the hope that we have through our Lord Jesus. We pray in his name. And we say together, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. May God thrill your heart with the hope of heaven and each foretaste that you have. May it cause you to walk stronger and more faithfully for Jesus Christ. Amen and amen.